In this session, we'll be looking at complex numbers. Now, if we trace back our memory a little bit to when we're looking at the, um, the nature of the roots of a quadratic equation. So if you recall, a quadratic equation is of the form ax squared plus bx plus c equals zero. Now, this part, b squared minus 4ac, is called the discriminant. So b squared minus 4ac is called the discriminant. Now, when b squared minus 4ac is greater than zero, we say the quadratic has real distinct roots. And what this meant was that the graph of the quadratic cuts the x-axis at two distinct points, right? Now, when b squared minus 4ac is actually equal to zero, we see this as real, repeated, or equal roots. And what this meant was that the graph of the quadratic was basically a tangent to the, well, it just rested on the, it just touched the x-axis. So basically, the x-axis acted as a tangent to the quadratic. Now, the most important one, which will actually be related to complex numbers, is this one, where b squared minus 4ac is less than zero. The discriminant is negative, and because in the quadratic formula, which was x is equal to minus b plus or minus square root of b squared minus 4ac all over 2a, that is the quadratic formula. And so see that the discriminant, b squared minus 4ac, would have gone into the quadratic formula. So therefore, when b squared minus 4ac was negative or less than zero, we said the equation had no real roots. Now, bear in mind, we did not say it had no roots. We said that it had no real roots. And the reason for that is that whenever you try to find a square root of a negative number, it would give you an error on the calculator because the square root of a negative number is not real, right? So whenever we dealt with um, the nature of the root of quadratics, we, we typically had three types. Real distinct roots, and that occurred with the quadratics, um, the discriminant was greater than zero. Where the discriminant was equal to zero, we said it had real, equal, or repeated roots, and the, the curve just touched the x-axis. Um, however, when the discriminant was negative, because it could not find the square root of a negative number, we said that the quadratic had no real roots due to the fact that um, we could not find the square root of a negative number, right? However, in our look at complex numbers, what we will actually be doing is introducing an imaginary number i, and that will actually allow us to find the complex roots of a quadratic, which basically had no real roots. Um, in other words, other discriminant being negative. Now that um, imaginary number i, so the imaginary number i is defined such that the imaginary number i is defined such that i is equal to the square root of minus 1. Now, some books will use a g, but in this part of the world, we'll use i. So, i for imaginary. So, imaginary number i is basically equal to the square root of minus 1, or the square root of minus 1 gets associated with the letter i, which basically is imaginary. Now, from this, we may forget that this comes from the fact that i squared is equal to minus 1. So an imaginary number i is chosen such that i squared is equal to minus 1, and therefore i is equal to the square root of minus 1. Now, throughout our look at um, complex numbers, we may um, encounter different um, positions of i. So we'll just look at some of these um, relationships between certain powers of i and, and so on. So for instance, suppose we have this. Um, we know i squared is equal to minus 1. Suppose we have i cubed. i cubed is the same thing as i squared times i. But of course, i squared is equal to minus 1, and this is the same thing as minus i. Now, i to the fourth, this will be equal to i squared squared. But of course, i squared is equal to minus 1, so this is the same thing as minus 1 squared, which gives us 1, right? Now, suppose we have this, for instance, suppose you have 1 over i. If you multiply both numerator and denominator by i, essentially, the fraction does not change, but can be expressed in a different form. 
So what does this become? We have 1 times i to give us i, and i times i to give us i squared. Again, i squared is equal to minus 1, the same thing as i divided by minus 1, which is equal to minus i, right? So these are just showing you how some powers of i are related to i, and of course, as we go deeper, we may need to use these little properties, but for now, we'll stop it there, right? So having introduced the imaginary number i, we now start looking at complex numbers. Now, what exactly is a complex number? A complex number basically is generally written, we can say that a complex number can be written or generally in the form a plus bi. And we typically use the letter z to represent a complex number. So for instance, suppose you have the number z, complex number. We say that that is equal to a plus bi where A is said to be the real parts and BI is said to be the imaginary parts. So a complex number comprises or consists of a real part and an imaginary part. And one thing we must make note of is that A and B are real numbers. So both A and B are real numbers. So A represents a real part of the complex number Whereas B, I represents imaginary part of the complex number, but A and B are both real numbers. So let's just look at some quick complex numbers, for instance. We could write Z is equal to 2 plus 3i. So here we have the real part, the imaginary part. We can also have Z is equal to minus 4 plus 5i. Once again, we have the real and the imaginary part. We can also write Z is equal to 7 minus 3i. And once again, we have the real and imaginary part. So basically, once again, a complex number can be expressed in the form z equals a plus bi, where a is a real part, bi is imaginary part, and a and b are both real numbers. Now, according to the syllabus, we should be able to express complex numbers in the form a plus bi, where a and b are real numbers, and we um, identify the real and imaginary parts. So basically, if a number is expressed in this form, z equals a plus bi, it means it is a complex number, the real part is A and the BI is the imaginary part, but A and B are both real numbers. Now, according to the syllabus, we also should be able to add, subtract, multiply, and divide complex numbers. And we'll be now looking at some of those operations. So, we're going to start off by adding complex numbers. So, we're going to be adding complex numbers. So, adding complex numbers. Now, basically, when we add complex numbers, um, let's say, for instance, we have these two complex numbers. We have z1 is equal to 2 plus 3i, and we have z2 is equal to minus 7 plus 5i. So those are our two complex numbers. And let's say we want to find their sum, z1 plus z2. Now, whenever we add two complex numbers, or more complex numbers, we must add the real parts together and we must add their imaginary parts together, right? So we set them up so that the real parts and the imaginary parts are clearly identifiable, and we add the real parts together and the imaginary parts together. So what this means is that z1 plus z2 is equal to minus 7 plus 2, that's a real part. Then we have plus um, 5i plus 3i. And so this gives us minus 5 plus 8i. And so z1 plus z2 is equal to minus 5 plus um, 8i. Let's do another one. So suppose you have a complex number, z3 is equal to 5i minus 4i. And we have z4 is equal to 3i plus 2i. Once again, if we want to add them, z3 plus z4 would be equal to, um, oh, sorry, I wrote 5i minus 4i. Let me correct that. So this should be z3 equals 5 minus 4i, and z4 is equal to 4 plus 2i. So this is 5 minus 4i, and this is 4 plus right, 3. This is 3 plus 2i. So once again, when adding complex numbers, we must add the real parts together, and we must add the imaginary parts together. So 3 plus 5, that gives us 8. And here we have minus 4i plus 2. That's going to give us minus 2i. And so this is the same thing as 8 minus 2i. 
And here we have the real part and the imaginary part, where once again, the coefficients are both real, right? So that is basically adding complex numbers. So which is pretty straightforward. If you have two complex numbers expressed in this form, then to add them, we simply add the real parts together and we add the imaginary part together. Now, what if we want to subtract these complex numbers? Now, let's use the same examples, but this time we're going to subtract them. Now, addition, of course, is similar to subtraction in that we basically keep the real parts together and we keep the imaginary parts together. So to subtract two complex numbers, we subtract the real parts and we also subtract the imaginary parts. So let's say, for instance, we want to find z2 minus z1. Then this is going to be equal to minus 7 minus 2, the real parts. And you can put a plus sign here, plus 5i minus 3i, right? We just put a plus sign to show that we're actually keeping the terms together. So minus 7 minus 2, that gives us minus 9. And this is plus 5 minus 3, that is 2i. So therefore, the difference between these two complex numbers, z2 minus z1, is equal to minus 9 plus 2i. Let's do another one using this, this pair of complex numbers. Suppose we want to find z4 minus z3. Once again, we subtract the real part. So this is going to be 3 minus 5. And plus, we subtract the imaginary parts. Now, this is going to be 2i minus, now there's a minus sign already here, but we have to subtract it. So it becomes 2i minus minus 4i. And so this gives us minus 2 plus the same thing as, now the two minus signs multiply together to become a plus sign. And so this becomes plus 2i plus 4i. And so overall, this is equal to minus 2 plus 6i. So therefore, we see that subtracting complex numbers is relatively straightforward. We simply subtract the real parts and we also um, subtract the imaginary parts. So that's um, um, adding and subtracting complex numbers. Now let's look at um, multiplying complex numbers. And again, we'll stick to these two examples using Z1 and Z2, right? I will stick to those. So suppose you have these two complex numbers, Z1 equals 2 plus 3i, and z2 equals 7 plus 5i, and we want to multiply them. So we'll say that, for instance, z1, z2 is equal to 2 plus 3i times 7 plus 5i. Now, this is going to be similar to multiplying um, binomials, right? Whenever we're doing brackets and expanding brackets involving binomials, essentially, each term in one bracket must be multiplied by each term in the other. So for instance, we can say that each term in the second bracket must be multiplied by each in the first. But what we must always remember when multiplying complex numbers is that the property of the i and that i squared is always going to be equal to minus 1. So i squared is equal to minus 1. So wherever we have i squared, that becomes minus 1. So we'll proceed. So the first thing we do is to multiply, say, the first two terms together. So the 7 times the 2, 2 times the 7, then the 2 times the 5i, then of course the 3i times the 7, then the 3i times the 5i. So it's going to give us 2 times 7, that's 14. Then we have 2 times plus 5i, that gives us plus 10i. Then we have 3i times 7, that gives us plus 21i. And lastly, we have 3i times 5i. Now, 3 fives are 15. This is plus 15, and then i times i, that gives us i squared. But of course, we must remember that i squared is equal to minus 1. So therefore, this becomes 14. We combine these two imaginary parts by just adding their coefficients. Um, so this becomes 14 plus 31i plus, and then of course, because i squared is equal to minus 1, same thing as plus 15 times minus 1. Right? So this is the same thing as 14 plus 31i minus 15. Then we have 14 minus 15, that gives us minus 1. So this becomes minus 1 plus 31i. 
and so therefore this is the product of our two complex numbers. So once again, when multiplying complex numbers, we essentially put them in brackets and multiply each term in the second bracket by each term in the first. And we must remember that whenever we multiply um, the two imaginary parts, we're going to get a term in i squared, and i squared is equal to minus 1. So what we realize is that whenever we multiply the imaginary parts, what we end up with is a real, is a real, is a real part, right? So multiplying two complex numbers, or the imaginary parts rather, will always produce um, a, a real number, all right? So multiplying these two, we've got that z1 times z2 is equal to minus 1 plus 31i. Now let's do another example. Suppose you have these two complex numbers, z1 is equal to 5 plus 4i and z2 is equal to 5 minus 4i. Now let's work out their product, z1, z2. So z1, z2 is equal to 5 plus 4i times 5 minus 4i. Now we must also remember that while well, multiplication is commutative, and what this basically means is that z1, z2 would be equal to um, z2, z1. So the order in which you multiply them does not affect their product because multiplication is, of course, commutative. So we proceed. So first term together, then first times the last, then second of this times the, that one there, then this one times that. So we say that 5 fives are 25. Then 5 times minus 4i, that gives us minus 20i. Then we have 4i times 5, that is plus 20i. And then lastly, we have plus 4i times minus 4i. That's going to give us minus 16i squared. Now we go proceed and simplify. So this gives us 25. But of course, minus 20i plus 20i, those two add to give 0. So those two terms cancel. Minus 20i plus 20i. And what left with is minus 16 times minus 1. And so this becomes 25 plus 16, which is equal to 41. So when we multiply these two complex numbers, all we get is a real number. And what happens? What is so special about these complex numbers? Now, if we examine them carefully, we realize that the only difference between them is the sign between the real part and the imaginary part. In this first part, the sign, of course, is a plus, And in the second is a minus. And these um, have a particular relationship to each other. As a matter of fact, these are what we call conjugates, which we'll look at later. So these are conjugates of each other. What exactly is a conjugate of a complex number? If we have a complex number z is equal to a plus bi, then its conjugate, which may be denoted z bar or z star, depending on the text you may use, you may see either, then z bar or z star is going to be equal to a minus bi. So how do we find the conjugate of a complex number? We simply change the sign between the real and imaginary parts from say plus to minus or vice versa, or from minus to plus. So for instance, the conjugate of z, a plus bi, is a minus bi, but the conjugate of a minus bi is a plus bi. So that is a conjugate of a complex number. And of course, whenever we multiply a complex number by its conjugate, we will always get a, um, a real number. So basically, imaginary parts cancel, and we're left with a real number. So as a matter of fact, we can um, make a, a little short statement by saying, for instance, if we have a complex number multiplied by its conjugate, we can say z times z star, in this particular case, is simply going to be equal to a squared minus b squared. And that is generally a, 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 a proven, trusted result whenever we multiply a complex number by its conjugate. But of course, you can take your time and prove it. In this particular case, let's work out this product. So z times, or oh, this should be z, z star, not z squared. So z times z star. So z times z star would be equal to a plus bi times a minus bi. And let's proceed to multiply. Once again, we multiply the first term together, a, by that, then a times that, then this times that, then this times that. And so this becomes 
a times a is a squared. Then a times minus bi is minus a bi. Then of course, plus bi times a is going to be plus a bi. Again, a b is equal to b a because multiplication is commutative. And then lastly, bi times minus bi gives us minus b squared i squared, right? So what this basically means is that, um, did I put minus? Sorry, there should have been a plus sign. a squared plus b squared, right? a squared plus b squared. So here we go now. The two middle terms cancel each other. So minus a b i plus a b i, these cancel. So what we're left with is this, a squared minus b squared times minus one, because you must remember that i squared is equal to minus one. And so therefore what this means is that this becomes a squared plus b squared. So therefore, whenever you multiply um, a complex number by its conjugate, the result is simply the square of the real part plus the square of the imaginary coefficient, right? Plus the square of the imaginary coefficient. So if z is equal to a plus bi, it means that z star is equal to a minus bi, and therefore their, the product of their, um, the complex number and its conjugate is simply equal to a squared plus b squared. And the conjugate, of course, becomes important whenever we're dividing complex numbers. And we'll look at that shortly. So we're no longer adding, but we are um, doing other operations on complex numbers. All right, so we just saw that whenever we multiply a complex number by its conjugate, what we get is a real number. And that property is generally used when dividing complex numbers. So we're going to be looking, now we're looking at dividing complex numbers. Now suppose, for instance, we have two complex numbers. Um, Z1 is equal to 2 plus 3i and z2 is equal to 5 minus 4i. And we want to evaluate z1 divided by z2. Now when you write it like that, like a fraction, we basically express two complex numbers like that. So it's gonna be equal to 2 plus 3i divided by 5 minus 4i. Now what's the next step? We mentioned that when um, you multiply a complex number by its conjugate, what you get is basically um, a real number. So as a matter of fact, whenever you multiply a complex number by its conjugate, the real number that you get is a part of the process or the reason why we call that process realizing or realizing the denominator of a complex number. So whenever we multiply um, two complex numbers, that is um, a complex number and its conjugate, we get a real number. So if we have, for instance, in a fraction, if there's a denominator or there's a complex number in the denominator, and we want to actually make the denominator real, it means that what we should do is to multiply the denominator by its conjugate. But of course, if we multiply the denominator by its conjugate, we must also multiply the numerator by the conjugate as well. And so that is a part of the process of dividing complex numbers. We must multiply both numerator and denominator by the conjugate of the denominator. And when that is done, the process is called realizing the denominator, meaning that we're making it real, right? So here we have the denominator, which is five minus four i. And the conjugate, of course, would be obtained by simply changing the sign from minus to plus. And so to realize the denominator, we have to multiply the, the denominator by five plus four i. But whatever we do to the denominator, we'll do to the numerator as well. So this becomes times five plus four i divided by five plus four i. No, because, so we can write this like this, so we can say that 2 plus 3i times 5 plus 4i divided by 5 minus 4i times 5 plus 4i. Now, having established that when it came to multiplying a complex number by its conjugate, then again, we see that a plus bi times a minus bi 
is simply equal to a squared plus b squared. When that is the case, and we are realizing the denominator of a complex number, we do not have to carry out the baby steps of multiplying each term in the one bracket by each term in the other, because you know that whenever you multiply a complex number by its conjugate, then what you basically get is an expression of this form, a squared plus b squared. So we can automatically write that down for the denominator. So this is going to be equal to a, which is basically 5, so this is 5 squared plus 4 squared. And that becomes the denominator of this particular fraction. Now we'll proceed to simplifying the numerator by once again multiplying the first term in the first bracket by that, then this by that, then um, this by that, and then this by that. All right? So let's proceed. We have 2 times 5, which is 10. Then we have 2 times 4i, which is 8i, plus 8i. Then, of course, we say 3i times 5, that is plus 15i. And lastly, we say 3i times 4i, that is plus 12i squared. Once again, i squared is equal to minus 1, so we can proceed to simplify. The two terms in the middle add, so we get 10 plus... 8i plus 15i, that is 23i. And of course, plus 12i squared, same thing as plus 12 times minus 1, because i squared is equal to minus 1. And the denominator now becomes 5 squared as 25, 4 squared as 16, 25 plus 16 gives us 41. I will simply proceed to simplify the numerator. So this becomes um, 10 plus 23i minus 12 all over 41, which gives us minus 2 plus 23i over 41. Now, is it okay to leave it like that? Yes, but sometimes you may be required to express a complex number in this form, a plus bi, where you can clearly identify the real part and the imaginary part, and so therefore, instead of leaving it like this, we write it as minus 2 over 41 plus 23 over 41 i. And this now is in the form a plus b i, where you can clearly identify the real part and the imaginary part. So this is a first example in dividing two complex numbers.